From the shores of Malibu, where the waves are pumping, to the Great Wall of China, and back to the streets of Las Vegas, where the UFC is coming. We are live. This is It's Time Radio, the show where we talk about what you think about but may be afraid to voice. Do not worry. We will voice it for you. We talk about everything on this time. UFC, President Trump, COVID, sex, drugs, rock and roll, politics, TV, you name it, we talk about it. But we have a lot to cover today. And first and most important, we have a very special guest on the show, aside from my co-host and producer, TJ DeSantis. Hi, TJ. Hi, Buff. But we're bringing on a man there's a lot of talk about. He's in the news constantly. If you're a UFC fan, if you're an MMA fan, if you don't know this man's name, then you're not a fan. So let's just bring it out right now. We're going to bring on Michael Chandler. Michael, how are you, champ? Man, boys, I am doing phenomenal. Like yourself, just got back from a 16-hour flight, landed in Vegas at 3 a.m. and then hopped on the next flight. I know you said you drove from uh, from Vegas uh, down to Southern California, I believe. Yeah. So just getting my feet back under me. I actually woke up feeling phenomenal this morning. And, uh, man, I, I, like you said, I couldn't, could not be feeling any better right now. We got a vacant lightweight title. And uh, my name's in the mix, so I'm excited. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, the whole lightweight division is now in a totally new vision with uh, Habib uh, retiring. I always said, Michael, first of all, let me say this. I'm very excited about you coming in the UFC. You and I had a chance to talk, get to know each other over the weekend uh, after the show and such as that. Um, you're a very interesting cat, man. You're very, very interesting, very intelligent. I know your background. I think you've got a phenomenal, phenomenal future ahead of you, aside from the past that's phenomenal. And you're in the show, babe. You've been in the show before, but now you're in the show. And I, yeah. Yeah, it, this is it. This is where I think every mixed martial artist in the world, you know, uh, wants to be. No offense towards Bellator, which does a great job, and the other organizations. I'm all for all, everything. You know, success breeds competition, and competition breeds success. Very important all the way around. But your pedigree that you've built coming into the greatest proving ground for fighters in the world, which is the UFC octagon. And I know you're ready. You are one confident individual. You really are. Well, yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm, no, uh, I'm no newcomer. You know, I've been around for a long time. And, and although I haven't fought in the UFC, um, I've cut my teeth in this sport, you know, trained with UFC champions, beat former UFC champions. Um, trained with a lot of UFC, the number one contenders and all of these guys. So I've been in the game for a long time and this has always been, this has always been somewhat the inevitable. You know, I, uh, you know, as you said, fighting outside the UFC, I've loved every organization that I have fought for every person that I have fought for. And I've had a lot of great ups and downs in my career, but this is where I always wanted to end up. I wanted this, to, I wanted the UFC to be where I, I came in at the right time though. You know, and it's always so interesting how, how God's got you right in the palm of his hand your entire yeah. life and doors, doors stay closed. Even if you're just banging on them and banging on them, you're trying to pull them open and they stay, they stay closed for the right amount of time until it, that door finally comes bursting open. And here we are. Um, and man, I, I couldn't be more excited. You, you know what, you know what makes Michael the most dangerous fighter to come into the UFC in a while, Bruce? It, it's me. the fact that he said he cut his teeth and he, he's, he's fought former champions, beat former UFC champions and not only beat former UFC champions, beat fighters that are considered to be among the elite top five, uh, top 10 uh, lightweights of all time. And there's not a lot of people, Michael, that get that opportunity to be in a main event spotlight. Yes, it's not the UFC, but you know what it's like to make that walk, to have cameras in your face, to fight elite level fighters. And, you know, th that's an intangible that I think makes you incredibly dangerous uh, in this division, which for my money is the most talented division in mixed martial arts history. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and that is true, you know, cutting my teeth and, uh, and also, you know, I got to tread lightly, you know, because I love, I love, I love my past. I love my past. And I love that I've been galvanized by my story and by the past that I took and, and all the people that were involved in it. But I swallow my pride a lot as well. You know, it, it's not easy beating and finishing Eddie Alvarez and beating uh, Benson Henderson and being ranked up there in the top. But also having a fan come up to you and say, hey, will you hold this camera and take a picture of me and Ryan Bader and take a picture of me and Greg Bader, take a picture. And I've had these interactions in the past, you know, and it, it, it was tough. It was very, very tough. And now, as Bruce, Bruce said, now I'm at the, in the ultimate proving ground, the UFC. And uh, I truly believe I've got a chip on my shoulder because, number one, I've got nothing to lose. You know, I'm the guy who came, who came in. I've already had a phenomenal career and won world titles, and I'm happy with what I've done. But now it's all just icing on the cake moving forward. And this is the scariest division in the world, and I'm excited to be a part of it. 
He, here's a, a, a little compliment to you, Michael, that I don't think you're probably aware of. But on Fight Pass, we ran this uh, little fantasy Grand Prix. Uh, it was the 16 best lightweights of all time. And uh, it was fan voted on. Um, and you were on that list. You were the number 13 seed uh, in our tournament, which, you know, it, it's a lower seed. Benson Henderson, I think, was number four uh, in, the, in, in the tournament. And, and you have wins over him, obviously. But the fact that the UFC was forced to acknowledge you without being able to show any fight footage of you, that's a huge compliment. In the past 10, 15 years ago, if you had accomplishments outside the UFC, they would refer to you as, oh, I mean, he was good in Japan, or, oh, he was a regional champion. The fact that you were on the short list of 16 of the best lightweights of all time without having a fight in the UFC, man, there's some true believers out there for you. That's uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely a feather in my cap. That's definitely cool. And it's, and it's, you know, I just feel like, uh, I feel like it's, it's moments like that, or it's, or it's hearing stats like that, or, or, or things like that, because at, at the end of it all, it really matters. What do the fans think? Right. Because the fans won't always remember your record. They won't always remember who you beat and how you beat them. But just like people won't always remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. The fans won't always remember everything about your career, but they're going to remember that, that you moved them. They're going to remember that, man, that guy steps into the cage and he yeah. fights with passion and he bites down on his mouthpiece and he, and he puts everything out there. And that's what I've, I've always wanted to do. And I feel like I've built a great platform outside of the UFC. And now I'm just, man, after this past weekend and, and Bruce was there, you know, in, in person, in the flesh, you saw the promo they, they cut of me and I was there cage side with Anik and DC I'm on cloud nine, y'all. Like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm right where I need to be after a decade in this sport. And truthfully, at, at, I feel like I'm 19 years old again, just getting, just getting right back into this sport. I feel like I'm a rookie again, and I, and I can't wait. Hopefully, fighting for that UFC title very soon. Hey, Bruce, guys? I bet you there was someone uh, this weekend that was showing a photo of themselves to a buddy with him and Ryan Bader. They're like, yeah, Michael Chandler took this photo. <laughs> <laughs> I was a great photographer for all my <laughs> UFC fighter friends. For all, the, all my UFC fighter friends, I took a lot of pictures. <laughs> you know, the thing is, in the, you know, in the last five minutes, it's gotten across exactly what I noticed about Michael, uh, being able to talk to him and, and talk to you face-to-face. -face. You exude exactly my bufferism theory of BSC, which is balls, skill, and confidence, right? And you got to mix that with a 20% luck factor of timing, which we all need in life. And right now, the career you've had to this point your humbleness that you exude is what's getting you there to be great is to be humble, I always say. And, and I try to practice that myself, whether people realize it or not. Um, the bottom line is you're open to every challenge. You're coming in at a time now when the UFC lightweight division is probably at the most exciting moment it's ever been, even though the great Habib Nurmagomedov has retired. And I believe that we will never see him come back like we see other fighters that come back from retirement. His makeup, his personality, his beliefs, um, his family believes everything he exudes means that we will not see him again as a fighter. Okay, we'll see him again, but not as a fighter. Even if he was still in there and still competing, it would have given you even more excitement to go towards because I'm sure you would love to face him. I, I mean, who wouldn't love to face him? It's the ultimate proving ground to face a man like Habib. But you've got a plethora of fighters to go after uh, to, to not just to prove yourself, you prove yourself, but to show what you're going to do in the UFC. Have they spoken to you at all of your first go, who it could be? I mean, it's something you can voice. If you can't, it's okay. But do you have any idea? And if not, what would you like? What would be your choice? So it's, re it's really great. You know, it, it's really great because it, I, feel like, I feel like I've been signed with the UFC now for a year or two, but somehow it's only been six, you know, five, six weeks because so much has happened. You know, I went from, I went from finishing Benson Henderson in August to an exclusive negotiation period to like waiting and waiting and waiting and counting down every single second on my watch to boom, going to Las Vegas, boom, sitting with Hunter Campbell, boom, on the phone with, with Dana White when he was on the tarmac to two days later, signing with the UFC to two days later, him announcing it on sports center and us starting to talk about October 24th. And, you know, Connor and Poirier now are booked. It looks like are almost booked and, Obviously, Khabib and Gaethje were already booked. So that kind of left um, Tony Ferguson, the odd man out, if you will. And, and Tony Ferguson turned down the fight with me originally on October 24th. So did Dustin Poirier. And they had their reasons. And I don't fault them for that. Um, so Tony Ferguson going into October 24th, going into UFC 254, was, was my number one choice. 
But now after that, now you have Justin Gaethje, who just got finished by Khabib, but he's still kind of at the top of the heap, and Khabib is, is no longer there, and we have a vacant throne on, for the UFC lightweight title. Um, at, at this point, Tony, they have not spoken to me, aside from they, we were trying to make the Tony Ferguson fight happen, or at least talking to them about it, and then start to talk about timeline. But now everything has somewhat changed. You know, everything has right. been kind of flipped up on its head. And even afterwards, when I talked to Danny, he's like, I had no clue this was going to happen. We got to go back to the drawing boards. I'm sure they're in Las Vegas right now in a boardroom somewhere talking about what are we going to do with the flyweight division. And I am sure my name is somewhere in the talks and, and I'm very happy about that. But, you know, I, I think uh, for me to come in and say, hey, I deserve a title shot right away. I'm not going to I'm not going to say I deserve that, but I am going to say I would I would love the opportunity. I'd love it. I told Dana, anybody, anytime, anywhere, if they need if they need to get a UFC lightweight champion crowned by November. I'll do it next month. You know, I'll do it this, this coming month. I'll do it in December. I'll do it in January, January. I'll do it whenever against whoever, anybody in that top five, but you got Tony Ferguson, who was originally the guy that we were talking about, but now you got Connor and Poirier and Gaethje and, you know, any of those guys, I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation. And I, and, and I, and I said this in the, in my, you know, during the broadcast with John Anik and DC, it, it's not enough just to put the UFC gloves on and put on the UFC fight kid and, and be sitting cage side and go to UFC 254. I love that, but I'm a fighter, man. I can't wait to get into that UFC octagon. So as soon as I possibly can, I want to get in there and I want to prove to the fans, both you know my followers, my fans, and the doubters who I am, and go out there and get in, into a physical altercation in that UFC octagon. It's you know? hard though. If I'm a manager, I'm not letting any of my clients fight Michael Chandler. Like that's that's, that's a tough, tough situation yeah. to be in. It's tough, but yeah. you know, as a fighter, you got to do, you got to take what's thrown at you and right. the kind of attitude you just exuded and what you explained, this is a winning attitude. This is the mark of a winner. This is what it's going to get you to the point where you're going to have UFC gold around your belt, whatever that time might happen, you will fight for it. But one thing I noticed about you too, Michael, I mean, the publicity and the PR you got leading up to and in Abu Dhabi, you get up on the scale, you weigh in, you are one of these fighters. I won't say a rare fighter, but the way a fighter should be. You're in shape 365 days a year uh, versus leap years. And with that being said, when you get the call, you're ready to go. And you proved it. The, the fans have seen you. Fans that weren't even aware of you have seen you. There's been a lot of talk. You are, you have a, you're on a flying carpet, man. You're on a red carpet right now. This is awesome. I love watching this. I think you deserve it. it you have an it factor to you, which not every fighter has. And what I mean by that is, aside from the way you fight, aside from the way you win, aside from the way you handle yourself before and after your wins and your victories and in your career, you, you're a full circle. You're a marketable fighter. You're a, you're a great fighter. You're going to be greater as time goes on. Man, the powers that be at the UFC should just be licking their chops at the ability to market you right now. I, I hope so. And it's, you know, I really, really appreciate that. Because coming from you, the guy who has, who has literally uh, <laughs> announced and and fist bumped every single big name <laughs> that has ever graced the octagon. I mean that that means a ton coming from you. And and I Thank just you. for me it's it's uh, and that's why I took this opportunity as well because I know that uh, aside from the UFC, aside from mixed martial arts, aside from sport, life is about relationships. We were created to to connect with one another. We were created to say that guy is my brother. That girl is my sister. In some, in some sense of the word, we are all connected. And, and I, knew there was a, I knew there was a 10%, maybe 20% chance that I was going to step into the cage against Khabib or, or Gaethje on October 24th. But the opportunity to be the guy waiting in the wings, the guy who could step up and, and save the show if bad luck had befallen either of those guys or the UFC – it's it's just my it's my blue collar son of a carpenter roots man my dad was a union carpenter and they and it, it didn't matter the alarm clock went off every morning at 5 a.m and they could call him and say hey we're shipping you out you're going to michigan or we're shipping you out you're going to california or you're staying in st louis my dad said okay i got my lunch pail i got my work boots on and and i got my, my white carpenter pants that's just what i want to do i want to show up to work and i want to and i want to i i knew going to ufc fight week to UFC 254 and getting to rub elbows with with all of my new colleagues and all of my new co-workers and and also being able to size up Khabib size up Gaethje size up the competition it was a win-win situation because so many people gave me flack for it out oh, the you know the guy just came to take some pictures or the guy just uh you know wanted to sit on the beach and sip my ties and get a free vacation it's like yeah y'all don't understand this is this is life is about moments memories and opportunities and I've got a lot of great moments a lot of great memories 
but it's only because I've taken great opportunities. And this was an opportunity that presents itself, presented itself. I wanted to be the guy that said yes, and I did. And, and here we are on the other side of UFC 254, just 48 hours removed. And I think it couldn't have paid off any more. The fact that the UFC is sitting in a, in a boardroom somewhere talking about a vacant lightweight title and my name's in the mix. You, right you, might, you, you might hear that flack. Sorry to cut you off, Bruce. You might hear that flack from some of the people that say, oh, he just took photos. But there are a lot of hardcore fans, Michael, that were very interested in seeing those photos and seeing what you looked like uh, ahead of a potential opportunity against one of the greatest of all time. And uh, the buzz is palpable, man. I, I can't remember an introduction, Bruce. Maybe you remember one that, that's uh, eluding me, but like, I can't remember the last fighter to come in from a different promotion that had this much uh, intrigue and, and excitement around them uh, as much as Michael Chandler has here coming into the UFC. No, it's one of the things I was about to point out. I mean, we've seen this happen many times. Uh, again, the attitude that Michael exudes on the show here, it's a winning attitude. But yes, um, when you think about how you've been projected to the UFC fans, to the MMA world, to the sports world, it's millions of dollars in free advertising, and you haven't even thrown a punch yet in the octagon. I don't think I've seen anybody get this much limelight going in, and deserved, well-deserved. And as far as proving yourself, well, you've already proven yourself to us who are true MMA fans already, but to the UFC fans, I have no doubt you're going to prove yourself wonderfully when it comes time to go out there and get into the show and make the show happen. Um, let me ask you a question, Michael. Uh, let me ask you a question. I'm asking you questions all during the interview. I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay, you've, you've been with Bellator, okay? Strike Force, Bellator. You've been with the, the biggest promotions. How does the UFC rank up in the way you've been treated this weekend, everything? Are we definitely a step above the rest, or is it just the same, same old, same old? You know, uh, Bruce, as I said, I, I, uh, I am extremely, extremely – thankful for my, my past and, and fighting with Bellator for a decade and strike force before that. And, and I want to tread lightly by never throwing shade, but oh, yeah, I love I mean, champions. I mean, no, 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 for sure. But, but, but I, but I only say that because in, in a roundabout way, I have to give credit where credit is due. I, I never in a million years um, would have thought the UFC is as intricate of a well-oiled machine as it absolutely is. I mean, when you talk about staff, when you talk about, and not just staff, like anybody can have staff, anybody can hire people, anybody can throw people in. Watch how you anybody say staff, Michael. Watch how you say staff. You don't want to say staff? You don't want to say staff? I mean, you don't want to staff affection. Anybody can have staff. You just got to get some good antibiotics and it goes away in a couple of No, but anybody, anybody can put together a team, right? Anybody can put together, you know, employees, if you will. But being around a UFC fight week and watching everybody firing on all cylinders. And there was an, there was an aura of confidence, competency, and, and also accountability with every single UFC employee that I came into contact with from the highest of the, the high, like heads of the departments down to the, you know, the gophers or the, the, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh in command, the people who are maybe just getting introduced to the, U the UFC employment. It is a well-oiled machine and you understand why the UFC is so successful and why the UFC has its, has its hands from as, the, as far as the East is from the West across the globe. And it is absolutely astounding. And, and this is me coming from the legitimate number two organization in the world in Bellator and Bellator it, you know, not to ever, like I said, throw shade. They they are great in their own right, but they are not even in the same stratosphere as what the UFC is able to do uh, every single minute, from minute to minute to minute. And the departments and the employees, and it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Plus, the buzz that the UFC is willing is 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 able to create that, and the photographers and and I mean, I had a I had a video camera on me the entire week, and I had a photographer at me with me at almost every workout and, and all of it was being documented because they know in order to make people feel something, you have to tell them a story. You have to paint a picture. You have yep, to right. paint it for them yeah. and then force feed it to them or spoon, not force feed it, but spoon feed it to them and, and create these stories. I was wearing a microphone with a camera on my face as Khabib Nurmagomedov was retiring unbeknownst to everybody. So now we have now we have real-time reaction from one of the top contenders in the UFC yep. lightweight division. It's just all of it seemed like it all seemed like it was it was ripped out of a page of a book, 
as if either they did it by accident or they're just so good at what they do um, or, or like, they did it on purpose or they're just so good at what they do that everything was just so well oiled. And I, and I could go on and on because as I said, I feel like I've been outside of the greatest organization for the last decade and I've always wanted to be in the UFC and now to see it, I absolutely, I, I feel so humbled by the opportunity and, and more than anything, now it makes me want to fight so dang hard inside that octagon. And, and I, and I hope that other fighters feel the same way because they don't quite know how great the UFC is unless you're not in the UFC. And trust me, boys and girls, if you're in the UFC, count your blessings because you are in the greatest organization in the world, not just by a little bit, but by ridiculous amounts. Uh, you know what? Your words are golden. I agree with all of them. I live, live those words weekly, you know, working with the UFC now, which will be 25 years come February of next year. And you know, what you've seen in the last few weeks, in the last few months, whatever, millions are being, you're getting millions of dollars in free advertising and promotion that in turn, and I hope this is true and I want it to be true, that you will make millions of dollars. So it's spending millions to make millions and it's not your own money that's going out, it's other people's money, yeah. right? Which is always OPM, other people's money is always the best way to do business in my opinion. Um, you're on a golden path, man. You're on a magic carpet and you appreciate it. And you're humble about it and you recognize it, and that's a key factor. And, you know, it's, how can you not be excited every day you wake up, the way, you're, the way you're saying this? It's just, it's incredible. You must train now with more vigor and more intense, intensity than you've ever trained. It's almost like being 20 years old all over again and starting it, it a career is. all over again. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is because, you know, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. There's been times in my career where, you know, the stakes aren't, you know, you know, the stakes are always high. The stakes for me have been high ever since 2011. When I, when I choked out Eddie Alvarez, who was the consensus number three guy in the world back in 2011. And then I was, and I've been with Bellator ever since. There was very few times in my career where I was not supposed to win and not just win, but win dominantly. So I was stepping into the cage with guys that I was supposed to go out there and finish in the first round and, and anything short of finishing, you know, these guys in the first round meant that I wasn't as good as people thought I was, or I wasn't right. as good as, as, as uh, you know, I was getting credit for. Now I get the opportunity to, man, I sh I'm going to be the underdog in my first fight, underdog in my second fight, underdog. And I, and I love being the underdog because man, I'm just a small town kid from Missouri and, and I have, have worked extremely hard, but now I feel like, I feel like I've now torn the veil off of who I am and and now to be able to go out and and reach the masses through through the platform that other people have built like you said other people's money other people's platform as well you know it's, it's the UFC platform that's going to give me um reaching more and more people and making personal touches and hopefully inspiring and motivating millions and millions and millions of people just by going out and doing what God has called me to do let so me, what, let you're, me, let me... what you're saying one second to you yep. what you're saying is you have a puncher's chance that's oh, what I, got a puncher's <laughs> chance. I do have a puncher's chance man i gotta i gotta get me some of that i saw, I, I saw john anix posting about that <laughs> it's going to be taken care of michael i got your address i think we were talking the other evening so yes, yeah we'll, we'll be sending it out if anybody deserves the underdog puncher's chance that can change the world and the greatest bourbon in the world it's going to be you i will take care of that my Love friend it. just give me a little bit of time it'll be at your door no, i promise you no problem you. thank you thank you of course of course I'll, go ahead I'll, tj allow me to share a story real quick uh november 19th 2011 was the night that michael chandler um beat eddie alvarez and i was in the hp pavilion in san jose for a ufc event that night and dan henderson and mauricio shogun who uh, put on one of the uh first real great non-title fights uh, that would go five rounds uh, in the UFC. And I remember telling everyone, I think that was the greatest fight I'd ever seen. And people were saying, yeah, but did you see Chandler and Alvarez tonight? And I was like, no, I, I was covering the UFC. I didn't get to see it. That night, Michael, you put yourself on the map in such a way that the UFC had one of its greatest fights ever. And people were talking about Michael Chandler. I mean, yeah. put that into perspective for a moment because that that was something that, uh, really launched you into the stratosphere. And we've seen you have this uh, really full-bodied career since that night. And, and one thing that I think that really makes you dangerous coming into the UFC, and I've uh, touched on this a little bit, and Bruce has you know, talked about your uh, humility and, and, and how humble you are. You've struggled. You've lost three fights in a row and rallied back from that. The fact that you have faced real adversity under some of the sport's brightest lights, that is such an intangible that makes you – more dangerous than 
a any fighter, I think, coming into the UFC in their first run in the octagon because you know what it's like to succeed under the bright lights, but you also know what it's like to battle through adversity and force your way back in when, when your back's against the wall. Yeah, TJ, Bruce, I mean, both you guys, I, I and the fans listening, like, I, I know what it's like to, to wheel my suitcases back after losing my third fight in a row and just sit in my little house in San Diego with my wife and cry and wonder, am I going to get the call from my manager like right. tomorrow that I've gotten cut? You know, am I going to lose my job? Is my security? I had just married my wife a couple months prior and I made a commitment to her and I promised that I was going to love her and take care of her and provide for her for the rest of my life. And here I am in tears wondering, am I going to get the opportunity to fight again in the cage uh, on a big stage or am I going to have to go down to the small local shows and drop down to 2,500 bucks a fight? And, right. and you know, and, and these were all real things that were going through my mind. And I was just a couple, you know, a year or so removed from throwing myself into the top five in the world after finishing Eddie Alvarez. And, and yeah, and then I know what it feels like to be on the biggest stage of my life at Madison Square Garden, at the main event headlining at Madison Square Garden, and then getting an injury in the first round and having a title stripped away from me, taken away from me because of an injury. And I think it's these, it's these ups and downs that I've, ha I've felt the highest of highs and I've felt the lowest of lows. So, man, I feel like I'm just I'm on borrowed time. And when, you, you know, when, you've, you know, I, when you've gone through it all, there's, no, there's really no way to go besides up. And that's where I'm at now, and I'm excited. Exactly true. And listen, it's not so much borrowed time. You're being given time now. Your time's being extended. So you're being given a gift. And I like a few things that you just said. I'm always a true believer that you don't know what it's like to succeed until you've lost. You know, you have to understand failure before you can understand success. I love the fact that you said you cry because I think that's truly the mark of a man. I mean, I'm Italian. I'm passionate. I shed tears all the time in films and I'm not afraid to show it. But if he's got a problem with that, that's their friggin' problem. Okay. That's the mark of a man. And the whole Rocky attitude you have, you know, getting knocked down and getting up and moving forward and punching harder than ever. These are aspects of life that are essential to the core of who you are to where you're going to be. So again, your pedigree, your attitude, your personality, and I've seen, I don't want to say I've seen it all because I don't really like saying that. I've seen a lot, and I've seen a lot more than most people in my 25 years in this game, uh, aside from my many years past that in boxing. Um, you've got it, man. You've got it. All you have to do is prove it. You've proven it. But just like myself, when I walk in the octagon every night, to me, that's my first night. I have to prove to the powers that be, the fans, the fighters, and myself that I deserve this job. I hear that in you, you know, you don't live on your laurels. We're not going to hear about the Eddie Alvarez fight beyond what you, what you talk about, which is a beautiful scenario, you know, with your wife and everything else. I, I love this stuff. TJ, I'm digging it, man. Yeah. I'm you a know, fan. I'm a fan. La la last thing I'll say about Michael, and I feel like this has been on display throughout his career is he understands that, you need to tell that story. And you were talking about that, Michael, with the cameras on you and all that stuff. You can't tell the story in hindsight unless you're rolling. And that's one thing that the UFC gets. They, they, you know, you said, is it on purpose? Is it by accident? It just is what it is. And that story is able to be told because they have it on film. And, you know, we're in, you know, 2020. Mixed martial arts has been a thing for a very long time. It's not novel. The uh, sort of uh, intrigue is worn off. It's, it's not just something that catches your eye anymore. People fight. We're used to seeing people fight. But the idea of who these people are and what they're fighting for, that is what captures people and intrigues people and keeps them uh, watching the sport. And, and that's one thing that I really like about Michael is how candid he'll get in interviews. And, and his story is one that I think everybody can relate to. And, uh, yeah, that, that it factor that you talk about, Bruce, it's on display time and time again. And more importantly, Michael understands that it's important to tell that story. Well, it is. And also, too, I see with you, too, Michael, is that, you know, we in my lifetime in the UFC and in fighting, there's been a couple of people that are truly legends, goats in their own right. Uh, we have one coming into the octagon next Saturday, Anderson the Spider Silva, which supposedly will be his last fight. I'm feeling like I want to bow to him when I announce him the way I did to Randy Couture. When, I, when Randy told me two weeks before his what was supposed to be his last fight, it wasn't, um, that he was going to not fight another fight. And I bowed to him. I think it was 103 in Portland, Oregon at that time. I don't, I haven't done that for anybody except for Randy Couture. But, you know, you look at Anderson Silva, and when you see people like Couture and, and Silva and the pedigree and the long careers they have, you aspire for that kind of greatness. You aspire for that. 
Is that something you would like to have for yourself? I'm, 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 yeah. I think I'm answering my own question, but I want to hear it from you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, that's, and that's what it is, too. I, I, think, I think one of the, one of the things that we, we often miss is the fact that all the people who have gone before us have given us the opportunity and cleared the path for us. Correct. You know, and even, and even with, and this is why you guys always hear me say, see you at the top. And I, and I say it all the time and it's an old Zig Ziglar quote, Zig Ziglar used it all the time. And yeah. because we all, we always want to get to the top, right? That's what we do. It's what we do. We want to strive. We want to, we want to go win things. We want to acquire things. But for me, if I don't, if I get to the top and I look to my left and I look to my right and I don't see the people that came up with me or, or the people that I inspired and motivated and pulled with me, you know, what was I doing it for? You know, all the people that I thank along the way from my from my elementary school teachers to my high school wrestling coaches to my college wrestling coaches now on into my professional career, all these people have been a part of it. And in order to attain greatness, you have to be grateful for the people that have been on the path. And for me, great, Randy, you know, coincidentally, Randy Couture was one of those guys. When I first started fighting, I threw everything in my, threw everything in my 1991 Chrysler 300 and drove all the way out to Las Vegas. And it was so hot that my running shoes uh, melted in the back, in the back window in the <laughs> oh 36 hour car ride. And, and I drove all the way out there and I moved out there and Randy Couture was the guy that I wanted to be like. He was a hard nosed American wrestler and I wanted to be just like, like him. And, and, you know, someday when I retire, I want to make sure that Randy Couture makes my book, which coincidentally will be called 688 Days because that's how long I went without winning a fight. Losing those three fights in a row, it was 688 days without a win. And just make sure that everybody knows um, how grateful I am for the people who have trailblazed the path so that I can do it. And I'll tell you right now, one of the reasons why I am in the UFC right now was because Dana White could hear it in my voice. When I didn't tell him, hey, Michael Chandler is this, 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 and this, sign me because I'm a badass. I said, Dana, I just want to let you know whether or not you want to sign me or not, I just want to thank you because every single dollar that I have cashed over the last 11 years, every single check that I have put in the bank has not had your name on it because I have not fought for you, but indirectly every single dollar yep. that I have made over the last 11 years, your name has been on it because you have quarterbacks championed and trailblazed this entire industry so guys like myself can make a living for my family and that's why people when people ask me how do you stay so motivated how do you stay so built up man it's it's just gratitude i wake up every single morning blessed with two arms and two legs and people like randy couture trailblazing it and anderson silva trailblazing this industry so that i can just show up on fight island get introduced to the masses and hopefully step into the ufc octagon very soon and just live my dream and i don't know if i just went off on a a tangent somewhere, but man, it's just, I feel grateful to be here with you guys. I'm grateful to be in the UFC, man. It's awesome. Where do no, I sign up not, for the Michael Chandler motivational speech? Yeah. Conference? Yeah. I was going to say, like, you my know, God. <laughs> when we, when I start doing my motivational speeches again, and some of the things, Michael, you may get a call from me. I need you to speak. So I, you I know, I, I, I'll have you out there with me when we get back to that thing. But, and even bringing up a guy like Zig Ziglar, who, you know, some of the top salesmen in the world, you know, followed, he had a great saying, you know, you need 10 no's to get a yes. You know, as a salesman, yeah. you get out there and you punch it. I, I, I see where you're getting this motivation from, not just from the Zig Ziglar's, but the fact that you point them out and even search them out gives me more of an idea of exactly who you are. Okay. So much, much respect. 688 and, uh, days. My God, that's going to ring in my boys. head forever. Hey, listen, long that last, time, boys. that last three minutes soliloquy he put out there, every fighter that's fighting right now should watch that. And yeah. if they don't understand it and they don't get it, they need to look in the mirror and ask themselves why. OK, because yep. that's the attitude it takes to be a winner. One thing I want to ask you, Michael, uh, in the pandemic situation that we're in, I don't think to my recollection you have fought in an arena without fans yet. OK, I, I did. He did. did. I did. He in did. August. Oh, yeah. wait. Yes. Excuse me. I'm sorry. So let's just go back. Let me turn my question around. Does that make any difference for you? Because I think for Conor McGregor, it makes a difference. I think he needs that adulation walking out of the gate. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's great. But. How was that for you? Did it affect you at all? I will tell you right now, and I just had a conversation with my friend today about it. I actually loved it. You know, it, it brought me back to m middle of nowhere, Missouri, 17 people in the stands watching a wrestling <laughs> match. You know, it, it brought me back to my roots. It brought me back to it doesn't matter how much money we're making, how bright the lights are, what TV network we're on. There's a wrestling mat right here or there's a, there's a, there's a, a competition mat right here. You got the four ounce gloves on and a mouthpiece. I got four ounce gloves and a mouthpiece. They got a referee right here who's going who's to enforce the rules. And 
whatever happens between these bells happens between us. And I, and I loved it, man. Cause it, it brought, it stripped away, it stripped away all the uh, materialistic, like you said, the adulation and, and the bright, it stripped away everything. And it just became pure, un, unadulterated, just combat and competition. And, and I loved it. I loved being able to hear my coaches. I loved being able to hear uh, his coaches. I loved, I loved being in that, you know, in that scenario. And, and obviously with the UFC, it's much, much bigger um, platform than it was in Bellator. So I, uh, I would love to fight with no fans. Maybe my first fight, just because maybe I'm just accepting that it's probably going to be like that the first fight. And I'm, and, you know, I'm hedging my mitigating the the risk of, of being let down by it, but I loved it. And uh, I'm, but I'm excited to get some fans back, especially when I'm fighting, you know, my second, third fight in the UFC fighting for the title. Yeah, I'm excited about it too, but I think you pretty well take for granted we're going to be like this for close to another year, you know, with the yeah. way everything is building up. So you've got the right attitude. As with everything else you're talking about, you got the right attitude. Um, I'm going to listen to this every day for the next year, I think. It's you know? motivational. Let's go, TJ. My Let's God. go. Like, I'm going to go work out or something. I feel good. Let's go. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm, tra I'm training for an hour and a half and 30 minutes, and I'm getting more incensed to get out there and start yeah. slugging it out. It's all good. Let's you're going to make go. it two hours yeah. now, Buff. I'm, I'm always good for two hours. Trust me. I hope it lasts for a long time. Michael, I know you've got to go pick up your son. You've got to go pick yep. him up at school. I don't want to hold you too much longer. Is there anything you want to share with us? Uh, actually, do share our social media for our listeners around the world. You know, anything at all you want to share, it's perfectly okay. Go for it. I don't care if you're going to sell a T-shirt. Just do what you got to do. Yeah. No, my uh, – yeah, so my, my – and I, and I am – thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this because I do uh, – I do Instagram and Twitter and my social media is obviously in 2020. This is the main way that we connect with people. And for me, yeah. social media is social. I like to interact with the fans. I'm the kind of guy who responds to DMs. I'm the kind of guy who, who sends messages back. So at Mike Chandler MMA is my, are my handles. Um, and, and I love uh, talking with fans as much as possible. And I, and I will leave you with two things, you know, I'll try to kind of go, make it all full circle. So you talk about, you talk about gratitude and you talk about what inspires and motivates and these kinds of things. Like I think gratitude for what I get to do and also gratitude for the fans. And I, and I start use, I started using this hashtag unsung grinders because I like that. I train extremely hard, right? I, I do. And I know that I, I, I live a clean lifestyle, a champion's lifestyle and I do and I do the best of my ability, but I get paid for it. I do. A, I do. I get paid well, to, to render my services inside my workouts and inside the cage. But there's so many people out there, the unsung grinders, I call them, the people that are on this journey, who are on the fitness journey, on the health and wellness journey, who are on the motivational, build themselves up, try to accomplish great things, and they're not getting paid for it. So to you guys out there getting after it, for no other reason besides the fact that you're just trying to create as much, human, as much of your human potential as you possibly can, uh, to my unsung grinders, I say thank you, and I appreciate you guys. And if you actually go to Going back to mindset stuff like we talked about, during the pandemic, I sat right here at this, at this desk and I sat down for 48 hours straight and I wrote, down a, and I wrote out a 14-day mental mindset booklet and it's, and it's meant to be read as a devotional, 14 days straight, read the book, um, read it every day. So if you go to unsunggrinders.com, people can download that for free. It kind of goes mindset stuff, um, a lot of motivational stuff. And then other than that, I will close out with my favorite Zig Ziglar quote of all time and it goes back to gratitude and service to others. Bruce and TJ, remember, you can have everything you want in life if you will just help enough other people get what they want in life. And that's the words that I live by. And if there's people out there who are inspired and motivated by, by my career, that is my duty and my pleasure for you guys. And I appreciate you guys for having me on. And man, I'm tickled pink to be here. And Bruce, I cannot wait to freaking pound your fist <laughs> when we are in the middle of that UFC octagon, man. It's going to be a dream come true because I've been thinking about it for the last 11 years it's going to be an honor i can't wait to announce you either it's going to be a big moment for me also and it's even more of a bigger moment now that i get to know you better and uh i love your theory of life because i have a similar theory it's called my three foot theory i want everybody around me to prosper be healthy and gain wealth and happiness and if i can help that with the people around me paying it forward i know it'll all come back to me and i've how, been that way my whole life how much do i owe all you life. guys for this motivational talk today like, hey you got to go out there it's free, but now you got to want to make use of it. Go close a deal. I'm getting ready to get on the phone. I'm going to close another deal. Seriously. I'm, I'm ready. I'm yes, ready. I I'm love jacked. it. I, I'm jacked. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Michael, listen, um, please go have a great time. Pick up your son. My best to you and your family. Please stay safe during this pandemic situation we're in. Can't wait to see you fight. Can't wait to announce you in the octagon. I'm going to friggin' roar your name louder than you've ever heard it ever before, my man. And I promise I you. I love it. 
I love it. I, well, I appreciate that. And man, just the words that y'all have spoken today, and I'm, I am soaking it all in my, my heart, my soul, my spirit. This is, I'm living a dream. I'm like a little kid at a candy store and I hope you can hear it in my voice. This is a, a dream come true and in a lot of different respects. And um, I appreciate you guys. So it's very evident, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on. It's time. We really appreciate it. It's a big motivation, not just to us, but to our listeners. I wish you all the best, Michael. I will see you around the, the Octagon campus very, very soon. There's yes, sir. And I will see you at the top. Yes, you got it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well, TJ, we're back. I got to tell you, I'm usually the one that gives the motivational speeches, but I think I just got one. And I, I'm jacked from it. Yeah. Like, wow. like LFG. Let's F and go. Yeah, really. Let's you, do this. You yeah, know, I mean, I'm ready. It, that's one thing that I really uh, admire about Michael Chandler is, I mean, there was a time where the UFC uh, title not only didn't seem attainable for him, but it didn't seem like he was going to make it to the UFC at all. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he, he ran into some, some really rough patches, uh, had some, some bad luck go against him, but he kept grinding, kept going. And, uh, you know, no matter how you feel about mixed martial arts and the marketing and the spectacle and all those things, I think Michael has that down. Don't get me wrong. But winning fixes everything. And if you mm -hmm. conquer the challenges in front of you, like he has, I mean, this man has beat Benson Henderson twice. Benson Henderson is one of the greatest lightweights of all time. There's Absolutely. no denying it. No question. And, and granted, maybe he got him on the backside of his prime, but the fact that, I mean, Michael Chandler fought everybody that he was able to fight. He didn't duck anybody. He fought the best competition that was available to him in Bellator. And, and the fact that he, um, you know, stayed positive, stayed motivated, and, and kept grinding is exactly why you saw him on the cusp of the UFC title fight in his first fight. Had anything gone uh, awry with Khabib and, and Gaethje, it would have been Michael Chandler. And uh, it, it's hard to say that he isn't deserving. And uh, I, I think he's in the, if we have to pick four fighters to sort of do like a mini uh, lightweight tournament, he's in that mix. To me, it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, Gaethje, it's uh, uh, Ferguson, it would be the winner of Poirier and McGregor, and then Michael Chandler. So, Yeah, I can't add anything to that. I think the words are perfect. Absolutely. No, a real pleasure to have him on the show. Actually, very refreshing. Yeah. And I, and I had a chance at the after party uh, or the after, not, there's no parties anymore, but the after right. affair we had. Right. Uh, to the bubble get, life. The bubble life to, to talk to him. And I just realized that I thought, I got to get this guy on the show. Yeah. This I mean, my, my kind of fighter. He, he's so an all-American kid who uh, has the look, um, you know, says the right things. And that's what's good, tubers. He's an entertaining fighter. He's yes. not just intriguing on the mic. Like, he goes out there and he puts on a show. He did some yeah. of the, the best fights you've ever seen uh, outside of the UFC. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be too, uh, you know, pro Michael Chandler here, but it's hard not to be. Like, he, he's a good kid who uh, you don't get mad at the success that he finds. You feel good for him when he finds it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, with all this grandiose and warranted and, and proper uh, – Kudos to Michael Chandler. Let's go on to some other stuff. We need Do we to have to? Because because the, the <laughs> news sucks, man. The news sucks, but we'll go on to it. Before we go into the news, we want to talk about the fact. And again, thank you, Michael, for being on the show. Total pleasure. Total pleasure. We have UFC Fight Night. We have Hall versus Silva, Uriah Hall, and Anderson Silva going at it. Anderson Silva, I think, for the first time, maybe not the first time, but it's surprising to see that he's a uh, 174, you know, underdog, an underdog to Uriah Hall. It's not surprising. Uriah Hall's a yeah, I, I would bet that. Uh, I, would I would bet that. How can you not bet on it? I mean, I don't bet well, fights, but how can you not bet Anderson right. Silva? I mean, yeah. Anderson Silva is, I mean, he's he's a veteran. He's yeah. he's savvy. He has the and ability to last fight. Things. Right. Um, also, too, no disrespect to Uriah Hall whatsoever. Great guy. But, no disrespect ever. Right, Great right. Guy. But when, when you're fighting Anderson Silva in his last fight, that, that's a tough spot to be in, right? Like, like, movies don't end with you losing your last fight. Now, granted, this isn't a movie. It's real life. But uh, Anderson has done so many things that are straight out of the Matrix and, like, a fictional world that it, it would be hard to see Anderson. I just don't see him losing this fight. And, and that has nothing to do with talent, skill, ability, anything. It's just his swan song. It, it just feels wrong that Anderson Silva would lose his last fight. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I, I, I see that. I'm, I'm actually – listen, I'm going to be announcing the fight. I think I'm doing almost every UFC until – uh, the first two in December, but I'll be on deck here for the next three weeks. 
or four weeks for UFC. And, and this is the one fight I'm really excited to see. I just yeah. came off the show where I, I was so tremendously excited, but this is the beauty of the entertainment value of the UFC. Every and, week you've got something new to look forward to. And, and you're going to be one of a handful of people that are going to be in the building for Anderson Silva's last fight, Bruce. Like, I, I understand that, uh, you know, it's your job and, and, you know, anybody's job gets to be a grind. You know what I mean? The travel's hard. The COVID tests are hard. I'm sure that's, that's all hard. But uh, in that moment, I, I'm – I'm not telling you to do this because you know you'll you'll definitely appreciate that moment. But you are very very lucky uh, to be able to witness that that last fight in person when no one else can. That's why I said there's a chance, and I don't know if like you know what I do till I do it. But you may see me go to one knee, and I think it's total deserving. It's warranted for sure, and 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 that's one thing that you. I mean, you outlined it with with Michael. Like that's not something you do for everybody. No, you know, no, and um, if there's anybody that's that's worthy of that, uh, it's it's the spider for sure. Yeah, no question. Spider Silva, one of my favorite people to announce. The name just goes right off my tongue. All right, hey, I look uh, forward to that on Saturday. I'll see everybody from the Octagon for that one. Go ahead. Boy. Bring bring your microphone up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. There I'm sorry. Go. No worries. Yeah. No worries. Uh, real quick, uh, before we get into some other stuff, there's there's some California wildfires burning. And, That's what I was uh, going to talk about, yeah. My, uh, my buddy Tom, he's a big listener of the show, I actually met Tom because of a Twitter post because he listened to the It's Time uh, program here and uh i i tweeted that i had moved to the city and uh he he got in touch with me it turned out he lived in my neighborhood two blocks up um he, he's been evacuated i moved uh, about two months ago uh so if i had not moved homes uh, i would be going through one of these mandatory evacuations so i just kind of wanted to send a, a little uh you know nod to tom we're thinking about you bud and you know be be safe and hope hopefully everything works out because it's scary man i it, Orange County here with the Santa Ana winds and everything, it's hard to breathe outside, Bruce. No, I know. I mean, you know, we talked about on the show before, and my heart goes out to the people because right now more than 100,000 are fleeing this uh, Southern California wildfire, which I got a call yesterday because uh, I have a woman that makes my meals, um, Angela. She's great. And so she pre-prepares my meals for me, which I can take on trips and stuff like that. And she's down there. She called me, said, I don't think I can deliver your meals on Monday. She goes, the first fire I've ever been in. It's right. only 50 acres, right? Yeah, that probably was, not anymore. That was yesterday morning. It's yeah. It's 10,000 acres yeah. since yesterday morning. And it's uncontrolled. It's, it's right. still un, not under control, you know. And, and they're, they're, able to, they're able to stop it from getting to some of the homes. But where there aren't homes, they're just letting it burn. You know what well, I mean? They, they can't get in front of it. There are different ways they work it. I mean, they'll set back fires or do all this stuff. I mean, again, praise. I bow to all the firemen and firewomen out there putting their lives on the line. But the Silverado fire and Blue Ridge fire, they're just yeah. going crazy. And, and I hope everybody's okay down there. But they're evacuating like crazy. And um, we'll just see. You know, this is, By the time uh, this airs, Bruce, I mean, who knows what it's going to be at. But, like, it, it's scary. And, the and West it's, Coast has been riddled this year yeah. with fires. It, and it's, and it's odd, too, because now it's finally cooled off a little bit, too. Like, I mean, I understand that has nothing to do with fires. No, but like, this is fire season because yeah, one of the reasons it's fire season, the winds. It's, oh, the winds are so gnarly. Like, like uh, it looked like it was snowing yesterday for a period of time because of all, all the ash in the air. Um, there's an orange sky right outside my studio right now. Like, you can't see the blue sky. It's orange. I know. I know. It's like got a dem wrong. It's, it's crazy. Well, let's just hope that everything gets under control. A few other things here. Uh, nearly half a million Americans tested for positive for COVID-19 just in the last week. The numbers are, again, raging higher than ever. Um, yeah, we're still yeah. opening things more and more. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's hard. I don't know what we're supposed to do. Like, still I know opening things, still having leaders, uh, not leading by example, if you know what yeah. I'm saying. No, I just, I don't know what we're supposed to do here, Bruce, because I understand that we can't continue. Like, my, my child's education right now is a nightmare. Like, it's a nightmare. Um, we get kicked out of these Zoom calls. He doesn't get let back in in time. Um, yesterday, the fire knocked out our internet. Like, one of the boxes burned down, so they had to deal with that. And Like, I, I don't know, man. Like, there's nothing more than I want than just getting back to normal. But I also know that would be horribly irresponsible. Uh, but it's a grind. It's a grind, and right now, now the news is reporting the fact that we should prepare for another COVID nineteen surge, and whether that's stocking up on materials for household yeah. cleaning and protection, materials for your medicine cabinet, whether it's decongestants for congestion, you know, cough drops, syrups for coughing symptoms, ibuprofen for pain, fevers, anti diarrheals, um, you know what that means. Uh, and he's a bad it's just stock for wounds, whatever. I mean, honestly, you should have this in because yeah. if you do, God forbid, well, get this thing, you got to deal with it. I, I just hope that if we do have another surge, that people don't fall into the same traps as they did before when going out and buying stuff. Like, 
I want to be able to buy toilet paper. Yeah. I want to be able to buy cleaner yeah. and hand sanitizer. Um, you know, if, if we are in store for another surge, I hope that we can look back at, at March and, and remember what things were like and remember that, look, you're a, a family of four. You don't need a semi truck load of toilet paper. No. Okay. No. So please uh, just be smart, be helpful. Like Michael Chandler was saying, like, you know, help people out, do onto others as you would hope they would do onto you. And um, just don't be uh, crazy. Yeah, save some Charmin for us. That's all I can say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I don't want the John Wayne toilet paper. You know what John oh, Wayne toilet paper is, right? I could imagine, but tell me, what is it? It's rough and tough and doesn't take shit from aye, anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God. No, I never heard that. It's pretty funny. Uh, if you can laugh, listen, you got to be able to laugh. You got to right. be able to laugh. Exactly. I don't want the yeah. John Wayne toilet paper. I got you. All right, well, listen, I just got back from, you know, uh, safety and protocol city. I was tested, what was I tested? Six times in like eight days. I leave for Vegas for UFC. I'll be tested again this weekend. I feel like I'm one of the safest individuals, but at right. the same time, I could walk out tomorrow morning or I have to go to the bank today. I got to go sure. to a store. All I got to yeah. do is come in contact with something it, and all those, all those tests go to shit. It doesn't you know? matter. You know what I mean? Matter. Like you are 100% at the mercy of your environment and you're not going to be able to stay in your own personal bubble forever. You can do the best you can, but you, you got to do things. And, uh, I'm pretty sure at this point, Bruce, you probably have like someone's initials carved into your sinus uh, after they've been testing you so many times. They probably left their mark at this point. Yeah, it's not that bad. I mean, everybody's fearful. Honestly, it's not that bad. Not, I've had, not, I've had it done. Deal. It's pretty bad. I well, mean, but, but I haven't again, had it done as many times as you, but it's pretty damn bad. Yeah, but you don't like needles, you know? So, I mean, I, yeah, but I've it's been, not a needle. It's worse. It's a stick in your sinus. I just, I figure if somebody else did it, I can do it. It's no big deal. Maybe so. you were just really good at picking your nose as a kid. You cleared a path. I don't know. If I did, I did it in private, but, you know, I guess that's pretty good. <laughs> well, you know, you, I mean, that's the best way to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, a couple of things coming up here. Um, right now, President Trump is a two-to-one underdog to win the election. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything, but what does mean is that if he wins, if uh, Biden wins Pennsylvania, which it's looking like. Yeah. That's going to be a big stab in the electorals. And, of course, Florida. Those are the two big states coming in. We're, we recording, this. We're recording this a week out from the election. There's no way it's done. No. It this time done. next week. It wasn't done with when uh, Hillary was the running uh It pretty much was time. done. It pretty much was done. Yeah, but when you read the stats on where Hillary Clinton was and where Biden's at at right, this right, point, right. a week before the election, it's very, very different. Now, I'm not saying – I'm not talking about who to vote for. I'm just right. talking about what's going on. No, what I'm saying is when the election happens on Tuesday, we're not going to get an answer on Tuesday. It's no, going to take we, multiple days, and then it could take weeks if it goes to court. And all that stuff. I just want it to be over with Bruce. It's not going to be over. If he comes out of the losing hand on Tuesday, next Tuesday, he's going to do everything he can to delay this, that, the other. And I feel it's just whatever. like a marketing thing, honestly. Like, I feel like he's, if he loses, I feel like he wants to go out while saving his brand. Um, very observant, TJ. I won't even comment, but that was a very observant comment. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, he's a, he's a master of marketing, right? So I won the election. He won it on the TMZ vote. I told right. that before. And you I know? don't know. I don't know if he can win it again. It, it's looking like he may not. But if he if he does, it'll be the same reason he won the first time. If he doesn't, uh, I, I feel like it, I said, I think he's uh, saying the things that he feels necessary to uh, maintain a certain image uh, as he departs. He's great at spinning it. We'll see how he spins it. Let's see what happens when it all comes out in the end. Did he right call now, COVID a hoax? Is that true? Someone told me he called COVID a hoax yesterday. God, I hope not because he went that's, to the something hospital. To com- that's something I'm going to have to comment on. But he's going to do everything he can. The election's a week away. He's trying to take people's minds off the COVID pandemic and put it on other things. But you can't take it off the pandemic in reality if you're anyway attentive to the news. And I don't mean if you're wondering if CNN or Fox or what, what news station does this. The facts, the reality is the facts and the reality. So let's just get with it. I don't want to get too political, but one thing I want to bring up is, you know, he did the 60 Minutes interview, right, with Leslie Stahl, who, by right. the way, has been receiving death threats since that interview. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't like the, the nature of the country right now. I, I, I'm worried about the election on Tuesday and what the next day is going to be because people are threatening to riot. People are threatening to do this, threatening to do that. Don't do that. Please, whether, whether Biden, but, it's, but they're threatening whether Biden wins or I Trump mean, wins. It's like a no-win situation. Okay, so, so people are looking for there. an excuse to get violent. Like, I know, that's I not know, good that's, either. I know it's not good at all. But now, maybe maybe President Trump has a, 
has a history of walking off. Do you know that the last time 60 Minutes interviewed him many years ago, mm -hmm. he also walked out of the interview when they were questioning about his casinos in Atlantic City, See, which were not successes? It's all, it's all a plan, like with him. Like everything is a plan. I mean, maybe, maybe both times he did feel like it was ridiculous one to leave, but like a dramatic exit like that, it's just, it just feels so in character. And that, that, that's one thing I don't like. Like it feels like it's a character. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Let's get away from it because I don't want to alienate no, we'll away, but, people, but it's just, it's bonkers. I hate it. I hate it but all. But you know, you know, another getting away from that situation, again, people, please get out there whoever you vote for whoever your choice is right. that's your choice yeah but get out there and vote i don't want to hear you talk unless you get out there and vote. i've already voted so and, and I'm, i don't want to be all uh conspiracy or political about it but like you can vote by mail people like this has been the easiest election easy to at least hand in your ballot whether or not you want to believe whatever that's fine go ahead but like uh, there have been more resources made available to you to vote than ever before hey let me ask you a question i don't know if you saw did you vote by mail I did, yeah. Okay, when you got your vote, the first one to vote for was President Trump, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then there were all the other parties, and Biden was down at the bottom. It's like you literally had to go all – I had to go all the way down to the bottom when I was looking at everybody to vote for, and there was Biden's name. Is that the way he, it is? He, he was at the bottom, but I, I think there's some logical order to why it is the way it is. Maybe the incumbent is always on top. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but why, but why the, the direct uh, – you know? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Direct like party, I, the direct uh, opposing party is at the bottom with everybody in between. Well, be, well that would like actually I, be favoring. It's almost like I thought, I, I almost but, like I thought President Trump designed the ballot. <laughs> right, but but th that would be favoring the Democratic Party if you say it's really only between those two. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. I think in an election like this, especially that is so polarizing, you're not going to uh, not vote for Biden if you planned on voting for Biden because he's at the bottom of the ballot. No, I mean, you got to just investigate everything. It's like, so, you know, read, read. I, I thought I thought Kanye West was running for president. Did you see the ballot? He's on there for vice president. Yeah, I was confused by that. I'm confused by Kanye West, period. So I, I really don't know what to say. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I had no clue. No clue. No clue. Listen, another thing, too. My, my city I grew up in, Philadelphia, was just enraged the other night. There's this uh, tragic incident of the officers. Um, that shot the man brandishing the knife outside his home. And uh, this is pretty bad. Everything escalated so bad that 30 police officers were injured. 30 people, 33 people arrested for, as usual, rioting, vandalism, and looting. One officer was hit by a pickup truck. You know? Uh, I don't really again, know what to say about it. I don't any know what to stuff, say. I, you know? just, the civil unrest that's out right. there is just unreal. It bothers me, TJ. I'm worried. I mean, Here's the thing. I do not endorse a lot of the actions and decisions made by police officers in this country. Um, you know, I'm not the, endorsing this. I'm right, only talking about the right, news. Right. No, no. I understand. But at the same time, like, they are the peacekeepers of this country. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I don't know. Um, there needs to be rapid change yeah. um, because we're, we're headed down a path that is, is truly terrifying. Uh -huh. Riots, riots should be. Hey, remember when these riots happened? Not mm -hmm. what, what? Hey, you remember these riots happened? Well, which ones? I don't know which ones you're talking about yeah. because there are a lot of them. Um, you know, my there, city, Minneapolis, got destroyed, absolutely destroyed. Yep. And was it justified? No. Nope. I I don't. I mean, I I firmly believe that sometimes things like that need to happen to send a message. Protest is justified, but not this. I I understand, but at, at times. How long can you have a peaceful protest until nobody, until it just doesn't do any good, and then you get pissed off and you do things? I'm not saying that's the right answer. It's not. No. But some people out there waiting to light a match. They're but the fact that it. it happened, Bruce, the fact that it happened, also didn't send a message because it's yeah. still happening. Yeah. And that's what is alarming to me. When when you usually get to a riot, wholesale change usually takes place pretty damn quick. Hopefully. But it hasn't, and I I don't I don't know. Um, I, I don't think the election either way uh, is going to solve that issue. And uh, that's the most important issue to me in this country right now. Time will tell, TJ. Let's just hope for a peaceful election and, and whatever the outcome is. The outcome is that's our president. Let's uh, pledge allegiance to our president, whoever it is at that time. And uh, I'm voting buffer. 
<laughs> I don't want to be a politician. Thank the, you very that, much. That's the problem. I don't think anybody really wants to be president anymore. No. Well, what a crappy job. It's, it's the hardest job in the world. Look at You're presidents. not going to do a good job. Whoever's no, I would, the next president, you're not going to do a good job. You do a it, fine job. Well, I'll do a diplomatic Man, job. I would love job. to hear the buffer State of the Union. Oh, I would be up there. I would do a good one, but I'm oh, not man. a poli I'm not a politician, TJ. I, I understand that. That's yeah. I mean, either Donald I don't Trump, I don't lie, TJ. I I don't lie, <laughs> so I don't think I could be a politician. <laughs> no, no, you don't lie. You just have selective truths, right? <laughs> okay, that's good. Alternative, let's get into, alternative let's, truths. Let's get into some sports, a little lightheartedness. But this isn't light. Odell Beckham tore his ACL. He's out for the season. That's not good. That's not good at his age, and uh, you know he's still an amazing athlete. But he uh, plays for Cleveland. Yeah, uh, Cleveland was supposed to be really great. I know, and I know. that hadn't worked out yet. Well, Antonio Brown looks like he make it make it down to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which is going to give Tom Brady a lot of weapons. I'll tell you, between Gronkowski, him, the other guys they have, we'll see if that comes down. I think they offered him a two and a half million dollar contract for one year. I'd still be very, very nervous about how he's going to act. And yeah, how he has himself. I mean, maybe maybe he's he, learned a lesson by now. I don't know. I don't think so. You know, I mean, he's done multiple things where it's like you know, fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. Like, I don't know how many. I mean, the guy is super talented. And with someone like Brady, that's a game changer. But totally. the end of the day, if I'm the team, I'm having him have a chaperone, man. Like, you're, I'm sorry. You have a babysitter. I gave you $2 million for one year. Uh, yeah. Probably a good chunk of that money is guaranteed. Uh, you, you're going to have to have this guy follow you. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, my Philadelphia Eagles are actually still set. I think they're sitting at the top of the division, which is amazing. It that they've won like maybe two or three games. I forget, but we'll see where that goes. The Vikings suck. Yeah, but the uh, the Vikings, well, you said they suck. Who, who are the, the Titans, the Steelers? There's some good teams out there. So we'll see how it works out. Listen, remember Boris Becker? No. Boris Becker was an amazing uh, tennis star. Okay. Huge tennis star. Made $25 million in his career. When? And it, um, oh, back in the 70s and the 80s. Look him up, Boris Becker. Well, that's, a lot, that, that's why I wanted to ask. That's a lot of money in the 70s and 80s. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Well, I, mean, I think more like 80s, 90, 80s and 90s. Let's see. Still, that's but, huge money. I mean, the average – think about this. The average salary for uh, a professional athlete in the 90s was not a million dollars yet. Like, like in the early 90s, it wasn't a full million dollars. Well, he was only 17 when he won Wimbledon in 1985. Dude, that's awesome. 17. I mean, young, young career. <clears throat> anyway, now, uh, basically, he's appeared in the London courtroom Thursday to plead not guilty to allegations he's been hiding his tennis trophies from debt collectors. He declared bankruptcy in 2017. Made $25 million his career and declared bankruptcy. Can they take his tennis trophy? I, like, I feel like... When, you're, when you are in bankruptcy, everything you have can be taken and sold, right? Man. He hit his trophies, and as a result, he had to appear in a courtroom. For it. But wow. it's kind of tragic. You make twenty five million, much yeah. less a guy like Mike Tyson who made over a hundred million and wound up, you know, losing it to <coughs> Don King. But, uh, um, you know, <laughs> however that all panned out, I, it just blows I, me away. And I read stuff like this. I, I've said it time and time again, most notably when referring to fighters that get into uh, uh, some issues. But sometimes success can be the worst thing for a person. And, yeah, you uh, either go for it or you're not. Right. Yeah. Yep. No question. Uh, Julio Cesar Savage. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Uh huh. Who I've announced in boxing. I've announced uh, two or three of his fights when I really? was doing the undercard. Oh, yeah. When I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, I did. Cool. You know, I, did H I did HBO many times with Michael uh, before I became exclusive to the UFC. And before I just stopped announcing boxing as an undercard because I figured I wasn't supposed to announce undercards. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, hey. <laughs> Sorry know. for me sounding a little cocky there, folks. But there's Not a point cocky. in your career. you got to make a decision. You, I mean, you got to value yourself, right? You set your value. Yeah. I would actually, you know what, TJ? I would only go and do that kind of stuff because I was making deals. Right. For Michael on the side of the boxer. That was my excuse sure. to be there. I was a deal maker. I wasn't hey, I was cutting if, my teeth on announcing, but I was actually there for ulterior. If life. you're going to go somewhere, Buff, you might as well get paid to do it. You might as well, you know, exactly. broaden your uh, portfolio a little bit. Well, Julio's uh, portfolio has been not been uh, narrowed a little bit. They His house was robbed. Oh, no. $740,000 in jewelry. Jesus. You know, and it How do you, you have wonder, that much jewelry, like not in a safe? Who knows? Maybe it was an inside job. Somebody know where it was. It's See, happened many times. That's what I think those things are. I mean, I understand now uh, we, we were talking last year, I think it was, there were a lot of break-ins uh, into professional athletes' homes when they were like yeah. uh, at the Super Bowl. I think Gronkowski had it. I think it happened to Mike Trout one time yep. when, when the Angels were away. Yep. Um, 
I, I feel like a lot of that stuff when when well-to-do people have a staff that you know basically help them get through life. Uh, I think those people tell people, "Hey, opportunity here." I've heard about it and know people that have suffered from it, and right. it's a very uh, normal thing. And that's why I'm you get that. Thing buff- that's why that's why you got that buffer system that we can't talk about. Don't even think about coming to Buffer Manor. You're right. going to wind up uh, leaving in very bad shape. Right. Even if I'm not here. Right. You exactly. say that. That's all I'm going to say. You got, you got it all taken care of. Don't even think about it, folks. Don't do it. Okay. So now, uh, Chadwick Boseman, who you know passed away tragically recently. Oh, horribly uh, sad. A signed Black Panther number one comic is hitting the auction block with his autograph on it. Mm. Uh, the opening bid's uh, starting at eight thousand, but they expect it's going to go for twenty five thousand dollars again posthumously. Some people's autographs yeah. become worth money. Uh, that, that'll be worth 50 in five years. It could be worth 50 when it sells. You never know sure. what people are going to pay for this. Well, that, that's the thing, too. Uh, that, that auction price, whatever it finally sells for, is probably going to set that price moving forward. But um, that's something to get your hands on. And if you are a collector, I got to believe, Bruce, that this would be the time to try to get that because it's only going to go up. Yeah, that's one thing I would say. Comic books are also another very viable collectible to have. Yeah. I've got a number of them, but nothing super expensive in comic books like I haven't. Sports memorabilia. I have one. By the way, book. I don't keep, just for the record, I don't keep everything at my house, folks, okay? Right, of course not. I've got other not. locations where I stock stuff because I am, I'm definitely keeping my stuff safe. Uh, you got, safe, you, got safe. you got the buffer bunker that we can't talk about. No, um, it's, not, it's not here. It's somewhere I, else. I, I own one comic book and I just found out the other day that I, I had it, forgot that I had it, but it, it's awesome. Uh, Nate Quarry came out with a uh, comic book series called Zombie Cage Fighter. And uh, I remember I, that. I yeah, remember that. I, yeah. I have the, uh, the first. Uh, edition signed by Nate Quarry. That's very cool. Yeah. It's worth like $7 on eBay, but it's worth a lot more to me. That's, what, that's the name of the game. That's what, that's what collectibles are all about, first and foremost. But if you got right. something that's a moneymaker and a gold brick, it's a moneymaker and a gold brick. Speaking of gold bricks, let's get back to Puncher's Chance. Oh, let's. Puncher's Chance now is selling more than most craft distributors, which supposedly do about 3,800 cases in the first year. We've done 10,000 in the first two months. Can I just say, Bruce, like I understand that, you know, I don't want to take away from your marketability on this. Like, don't get me wrong. You're, you're uh-huh. a fantastic marketer, but it is a cool bottle. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> it is so, like it, you are drawn to it. Like when it's, when it's on the shelf and you look at the other bourbons, like that's the one that sticks out. It's like, wait, what is this one? And uh, accomplished. I would expect accomplished. nothing less from someone like you, but uh, no, it's super cool. It's awesome. I'm going to give that credit to my partner, Umberto Lucino. Umberto Lucino. Um, he's an amazing marketer. He put together this bottle. He designed it. Uh, the man was involved with marketing of Campari, if you've ever heard of Campari. Uh, you know, and going back and forth, the man's brilliant. And he just put together this bottle. It's amazing. But what I'm excited to say, if you're in Florida, Winn-Dixie, 240 of the stores in Florida, will be carrying Puncher's Chance, if not already. And in California... There'll be 400 Albertsons, Pavilions, and Vaughn stores carrying Puncher's Chance by December, January. I'm going to buy one. You're going to buy an Albertsons? Uh, no, not an Albertsons. Oh, you Puncher's need a Puncher's Chance. Chance. Okay, yeah. good. Jeez. <laughs> Buff, come on, man. I'm, hey, I'm, listen. Not, I'm not in your tax bracket. <laughs> well, sometimes when you're in a tax bracket, you got to make sure the money goes somewhere. But I don't know if I would buy a grocery store. No, no. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, you might make a lot of money these days. The, and the shelves are empty at grocery stores. Oh. <sighs> You know what? It's, uh, there's money to be made out there, pandemic or not. There's money to be made. But uh, let's just hope everybody's doing well. I wish that to everybody. TJ, um, before we sign off, take the uh, dais. What's up? Uh, coming up this Saturday night, you can check out Extra Rounds with myself and Dean Thomas. We'll be wrapping up uh, the fight card that features Anderson Silva and Uriah Hall in uh, potentially Anderson's final fight of his uh, historic career. So please tune in uh, to that. That's live on the UFC Fight Pass Facebook page. Uh, by the time you hear this, you can listen to our preview show, uh, which will also be available on the Fight Pass Facebook page. But uh, it takes usually a couple of days, but uh, all of our episodes uh, are available on UFC Fight Pass. So you can check that out, uh, whether it's on the Apple TV, the Roku, your iPhone, Android, wherever you can uh, watch Fight Pass. Uh, you can see me and Dean Thomas. Very cool. Very excited for you, TJ. I'm, I'm happy to see the progression that's going on with that. I mean, you know, approaching what, nearly a million views? Oh, well over a million. Well views. over a million. Yeah, views. yeah. We've uh, we've broken, I think, one point five on a couple of the uh, episodes. So uh, we're doing well. TJ DeSantis opening a corner liquor store near you soon. There we hey, go. Hey, hey, taking all that money. Uh, we're only going to sell Puncher's Chance, though. <laughs> That's all right. Sell a lot of it. I'll come in and uh, autograph the bottles for you. All right, everybody. Love- 
exciting uh, week passed. 10 days, 12 days passed with the Abu Dhabi adventure to fight Island. Everything went great. We talked about it last week and it held that consistency all through the week. You can see the posts I made because I tried to post about every other day or so, you know, day one of the adventure, day two, day six on my Instagram, go to uh, at Bruce Buffer UFC, Twitter at Bruce Buffer. I'm getting pretty good at uh, being a little more consistent on my social media for you and for myself. So uh, with that being said, TJ, you have a great week. We'll be back next week with a dynamite guest. Really, really really just motivating and a pleasure to have somebody like Michael Chandler on the show today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Incredible. So awesome with that being sauce. said, yeah, it's awesome. Awesome sauce, as they say. With that being said, uh, everybody, set your goals, write them down. Think ahead, three, three steps ahead. Make sure you educate yourself on what your goals are all about. So when you set on that path to achieve them, you are the best you can be. And then you're winning. It's not about being first. It's not about being second. It's about being the best you can be. And if you are first, then enjoy it and revel in it. I wish you all the best. Wish everybody all the best. Stay safe. Wear your mask. Practice your protocol. And please get out there and vote next week because we, our show will not be till after the election. We'll have plenty to talk about on the show. We are definitely not recording the show on a Tuesday. That's for sure. And uh, we will have that all happening next week. Maybe I think we'll have Sammy on because she might have a few things to say next week. That's for sure. Oh, no. I don't know oh, if we're no. ready for that. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that decision next week. <laughs> all right, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. The best of uh, life to you. The best of everything. Health, wealth, and prosperity. Stay healthy. Be happy. Buffer out. Big smile on my face. And it's all for you. Cheers.